back. Uh, oh, it's a. Uh, I'll start it over. Welcome, everyone. My name is Salim Razak, and I am the uh, director of the Social Accountability and Community Engagement Office. Uh, and uh, it is uh, my pleasure, uh, from from my office's perspective, uh, to co-host the this uh, Black History Month event uh, with the School of uh, Population and Global Health, um, and. Um, Together, uh, we have uh, been able to bring um, a wonderful speaker, Dr. Samuel Kelton Roberts, uh, who is a uh, historian of, um, uh, of racism and public health. Uh, I think it's more complicated than that, and I'll let him explain, um, but who's able to really uh, talk a little bit about uh, racism and public health. Uh, and we hope to have a lot of time for questions uh, at the end. Um, this uh, session builds upon um, uh, the film viewing that we had offered a couple of days ago of uh, the film Miss Evers Boys, uh, which is all about the uh, Tuskegee uh, trials. And, um, you know, uh, you don't need to have watched the film to, to, to be at this session, but we really wanted to show you, um, uh, give you the opportunity to see some interpretation through art, the art of film, of uh, some of the issues um, that, that, that are brought up today. Um, Dr. Kelton Roberts will, will talk um, a fair bit about the United States context. And... Um, I think that that's very, very important and very, very relevant uh, for us in Canada. Um, and I, I, I think that I, I uh, as a Canadian, um, I want to, um, to, to uh, encourage us to open our eyes um, to the injustices in our own country uh, as, as we hear this talk. Um, uh, as an immigrant growing up here in, in Canada and a kind of watching American TV and so on, one of the hidden messages that was not so good is that maybe the, maybe the stuff is happening south of the border, but I think we all know that the, um, the stuff is happening uh, here as well. So I hope we have, stimulate reflection and, and thought um, uh, on that issue as well. Before I introduce um, our moderator, Dr. Banerjee, I want to just give a, a, a special and amazing thank you to Iman Ahmed, who is, um, uh, who is the uh, officer uh, in the Social Accountability and Community Engagement Office for the wonderful um, uh, thought and arrangement of, of, of all of the events of um, Black History Month uh, this year. Uh, it's really been a, a fabulous year. So thank you, Ima. Let me um, introduce Dr. Banerjee. Uh, who is going to um, moderate the session, and she will uh, give a much more fulsome introduction to Dr. Roberts. So Dr. Ananya Tina Banerjee is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health here at McGill. Um, uh, her interdisciplinary research embeds a strong emphasis on community-based participatory pedagogy and research, which is grounded in collaboration and partnership with racialized communities. She was recently, uh, as of a few days ago, um, appointed as the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Lead in the School of Population and Global Health. So we're very excited uh, by that and um, hoping to uh, set up a rich collaboration uh, between our offices. Often the research questions she pursues are community defined problems in the context of health equity and intersectionality. And in, her work has been funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and the Public Health Agency of Canada. She developed and offered the first course on race and health um, in, a, in a school of public health in Canada seven years ago. And recently she uh, was a recipient of the Faculty of Health Sciences and Medicine uh, FHSM Teaching Innovation Award for her anti-racism and anti-oppression practice in uh, the learning environment. So thank you, uh, Dr. Banerjee, and over to you. 
Thank you, Dr. Razak and Iman uh, and uh, Sais uh, for introducing me and giving me the honor to moderate uh, this joint co-sponsored event uh, between our two offices, uh, including the School of Population and Global Health during Black History at a Month at McGill University. Um, to our audience, I invite all of you and please take this opportunity for us to be reminiscent of how our medical and public health systems and policies are rooted in racism and injustices. For many of us who have watched the film screening of Miss Evers' Boys uh, this week, it was an awakening and a somber reminder of how the historic Tuskegee study destroyed the trust of many African Americans held for medical and public health institutions, a legacy that unfortunately persists today. Racism and white supremacy are not imported from the US. We need to substantiate that Canada has its own history of white supremacy and extremism. Reminder that Canada has an Indian Act and it became mandatory for every indigenous child to attend a residential school and illegal for them to attend any other educational institution. As of September 29th to 2021, there have been documented 4,118 Indigenous children who were murdered at these residential schools, a number that is undercounted. To understand how racism is a historical and contemporary struggle influencing health inequities, it is my utmost honor to introduce our prominent guest speaker for today, Dr. Samuel Kelton Roberts. Dr. Roberts is an Associate Professor of History at Columbia University in the School of Arts and Science and an Associate Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health. He is a former director of Columbia University's Institute for Research in African American Studies and also recently has joined Columbia's new Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies as Associate Professor. Dr. Roberts writes, teaches, and lectures widely the history of public health and medicine, urban history, movements for social justice, African American history, and on issues of policing and criminal justice. His widely acclaimed books, Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and the Health Effects of Segregation demonstrates the historical and continuing links between racial segregation and poor health outcomes. Dr. Kelton will be speaking for about 40 or 45 minutes, and followed by that, we hope to have an enriching uh, question and answer period. Please raise your hands if you wish to speak or you would like to post your question in the chat box. We also invite you throughout uh, this event to comment in the chat box to generate um, engaging conversations as we have a lot to learn and unlearn for the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, Dr. Kelton, uh, again, it is our honor uh, to have you here and we welcome you and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ananya. Thank you, Aman. Thank you, Salim. Thank you to all of you, to all of, uh, everyone who made this, um, this uh, appearance possible. I've really looked forward to it and uh, have given a lot of thought to what I want to say uh, today. Um, so uh, you probably heard that there's been a pandemic for the past uh, couple of years or so. And uh, it's certainly, I think, for people like me, been an occasion to think about the health inequities that gave us, um, certainly in the US context, but I think as Ananya, uh, as Dr. Banerjee just alluded, um, I think you all saw similar inequities in Canada and certainly in other places around the world. Um, and who carries the burden of disease and death um, in, an, in, in infectious disease? And uh, it's, it's been an occasion for me, I've been asked on many an occasion uh, to, to speak a bit about the history of that. And it's a long history and it's a very complicated one. Um, and despite, you know, two years of discussion, I'm not quite entirely sure that I, um, that I can, um, that I have a grasp of all the myriad facets that go into our current predicament. And when I say our current predicament, I don't mean just COVID-19. Um, I know it's hard to remember anything before COVID-19, but they weren't exactly great 
in 2019 either. We had health disparities or health inequities, um, certainly in the United States and what I think I understand about the Canadian context um, there as well. If I had to boil it all down, um, which you should probably never ask a historian to do that because we, we live in the comfort of nuance and complexity, but um, if you really press us to, we will distill something down into a pithy you know, sentence or two. Um, and if I had to do that, I would say if, if, if asked where to turn our analytical lens, how to frame a problem, um, I would say, at least certainly in this country, I would point you in the direction of a consideration of racial capitalism. And I think that'll be a good place to, um, uh, for me to begin with, you know, what do I mean by that? Um, and particularly here, I want to discuss the health effects of state imposed or sanctioned um, ethnic or as some people call it racial um, historical segregation from in the United States that went from roughly the 1880s until the 1950s or so. Um, the legal part of it. Now we do certainly have residential segregation and various types of you know, employment segregation persistent into the year 2022 and hopefully not too much further into the future, but um, certainly now and in the near future, those seem to persist. Um, and let me, I just realized I am not sharing my screen, am I? So I will do that in just a moment. All right. Um, Aman and Ananya, the screen is okay. You all, everyone, can you all see my uh, my title slide? Yes. Oh, okay. Great. Fan. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So a few things um, in terms of the the notes that I want to hit today. I want to talk about, and I frame these in terms of learning objectives, which I found that students quite often find it easier to latch onto something, particularly something as complicated as this. So remember these three things that we're going to talk about racial capitalism, which I will define shortly. Um, we will talk about health inequities, and then also combining the two historical and contemporary health effects of racial segregation. Those are the three things. There'll be lots of details along the way, but those are the three big takeaways there, along with some you know, historical lessons. In terms of our periodization, the period that I've chosen from the 1880s to the 19, or 1950s or so has a kind of twofold uh, periodization. And periodization is what we historians think about in terms of you know, the beginnings and ends of a trend. Um, and so for this, for my, for this discussion, look, we're going to talk about the 1880s to the 1950s. And so first in this period is the place of, as I said, judicial, which is to say legally sanctioned and enforced segregation. Um, by the 1950s, of course, the civil rights movement's constitutional assault on Jim Crow was well underway, including, um, uh, you know, it, uh, important cases in 1954 about education, um, certainly in college education, uh, a decade before that as well. And then that period, we could say, ends the, the legalistic part, the formal part ends around 1968 with the Fair Housing Act um, of 1968. But this period is also overlaps, it's coterminous with um, an epidemiological uh a periodization, which is to say the advent of, of germ theory or of um, bacteriology, to be more specific, actually, begins 1870s, 1880s, depending on you know whom you ask and what event you privilege. Um, and it goes well, well, it continues till today, I mean, obviously, but uh, we could say that a periodizing event is the discovery of antimicrobials in the 1940s. Here we think of, you know, you know, most famously penicillin. Right. So there's more or less to say, you know, this period of about six decades when we know the pathogenic causes of disease. I'm going to say pathogenic because there's also the social context, which is really what I'm going to talk about today. Where we've identified the pathogenic, the microbial causes of diseases, but we didn't really have, quote unquote, cures for them. And this is a pivotal moment, I would say, in the, in the history of public health and medicine. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a coincidence that the two overlap, these two periodizations overlap, but um, they don't do so in isolation. So it's a coincidence that actually has a, a confluence as well. Um, what do I mean when I say the health effects of residential segregation? Um, first, we should say that it's a, in, in my 
you know, formulation here, it's a product of what Cedric Robinson called racial capitalism. And you might have heard this term used variously in, in, in political science and economics in sociology and history, et cetera, et cetera. It originates in um, the work of Cedric Robinson, a political theorist uh, who advanced the term in the early 1980s. He himself was building from, as you know, as we all do, uh, building from previous scholars, particularly Oliver Cromwell Cox, who was a Trinidadian sociologist, uh, who also talked about kind of the the how capital capitalism is born and built upon you know racial regimes, particularly here in the Western world or in, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I also want to talk about the geography of urban industrial capitalism as being formed in part, going back to racial capitalism, uh, by racially segmented labor forces. And then simply, though not exhaustively put, we could say the health effects of segregation may refer to the differentials and health outcomes experienced by populations by virtue of their social, economic, and geographic experiences of racial ascription. This is to say, you know, in shorter terms, which are a little more, which is a little more clunky, um, by their race, so to speak. Um, inevitably, this is all bound up within the urban political economy of race and health, with its attendant connections to systems of gender, space, labor, and class, and culture. Right? These are the kind of the big framing questions. Um, Let's talk about a definition of racial capitalism. This is Cedric Robinson, who I mentioned before, uh, the cover of the book, um, Black Marxism, in which he theorizes against um, or certainly pushing back to the kind of formal or traditional Marxist interpretations of capitalism, um, pointing out that many of those, including those of Marx himself and moving forward, um, where they have failed to really take into account how race has built capitalism. Um, and capital, of course, but really capitalism as an ideology. Racial ideology is within, not next to, but within the ideology of capitalism. Um, the concept itself is complicated. Um, and we actually, you know, I've tried to find a kind of pithy and concise definition, and they don't really exist. But we can certainly infer from the work of Robinson, as I said, Oliver Cox and others. Um, Robinson himself deployed the term to signal his insistence that racial projects are and always have been part of the historical capitalist um, project. Um, in contrast to theorists, like I said, including Marx, but also Adam Smith, right? I mean, this isn't, I, I wanna be clear that I'm not just talking about an ideology here. Um, this is an analytical frame. In, in contrast to those um, who depicted the advent of European capitalism as a complete break with feudalism, Robinson argued that modern capitalism made use of what today we call racialization. In short, the turning of particular populations into racial others. Um, this is important because for, as I'll argue later, to have these ideologies that support the system, uh, quite often, and I think some theorists might say almost always, an ideology of racial otherhood, and which usually implies inferiority, um, is, is brought to bear within that ideological construction. I want to be very clear that when I talk about capitalism, that I'm not being um, myself polemical or ideological. I think many people, when they hear someone use the term, they automatically assume that what's behind it is a kind of incogitant and reflection, reflective or reflexive critique. I do have my thoughts about capitalism as a system, but uh, today and for the purpose of this talk, I'm just speaking analytically um, in terms in which that I think if someone who is very critical of capitalism or someone who is very much uh, in support of capitalism should be able to understand that it is a system of production in which value is extracted from people who bring to bear their labor um, and are employed through capital brought to bear by people who have capital, all right? That's just kind of baseline definition, absent any sort of critique or whatever. What I'm saying here is that part of that system here, particularly in the Western hemisphere, particularly in the United States, and certainly to a degree uh, in Canada and certainly entirely in, I mean, the Caribbean, the history of the Caribbean is really based upon, you know, the building of, of you know, plantations that were, you know, you know, that were, you know, worked by people who were, you know, brought here against their will, um, that racialization is part of that project. All right. These are just basic analytical assertions here. Um, the, the history of racial capitalism continues to the current day and in a very broad sense might be defined as those processes and social relations in which individuals, institutions, or the state itself accumulate social and economic value 
from the implicit or explicit racialization um, of a group of people. All right, so just to give you a few examples before we continue on for the um, historical examples, we might think of, for example, um, under residential segregation, where certain people cannot live in certain neighborhoods, this is a way of wealth extraction. You might say, you know, Dr. Roberts, how is that so? We're just talking about separating people. Well, in fact, what it is is a system in which people in a limited housing market end up, and this is historically true, this is born by fact in every situation to the point where you could, if you could talk about a historical law, which I'm not sure I advise because history is very specific, but if one were to look for historical law, one might find it here, that where you have um, juridical residential segregation, you have somebody making a buck, so to speak. Somebody's making money. And in this case, it's where you can charge people more money for lesser housing because they're what you would call a captive audience, so to speak. You have a monopoly. They can't go to an open market. Same thing with labor, where you have ethnically segregated labor forces. You can hire people who um, are above their skill level and pay them below their skill level. Or you can hire people in a position that is below their skill level and also pay them a wage that is below that and even below the work that they render because they really can't go anywhere else. Um, I might also add that here in the United States, this also goes for people with, um, with criminal records as well. There's a lot of people making a lot of money hiring people who can't get jobs anywhere else because they have a criminal record and so they have a captive market there. And they in fact are extracting value from people's labor that way. It goes on and on and on. I think you all get what I'm saying here. Um, all right, let me just go to my next slide before I, I'm actually going to skip that one as well. So the health effects of segregation before 1950 might be divided into roughly a couple of fields, right? There are the various health conditions and diseases which affected Black Americans directly as a result of segregation. Or right, I'll talk a bit about of these um, as well. We could call this this bundle of conditions health inequities. Notice I'm not saying health disparities. A disparity is just a basic um, a basic descriptive you know, fact. Um, one glass of water may have less water than another one. That is a disparity, right? It has nothing to do with equity at all. It's just somebody put more water, maybe it's got more capacity, who knows? It's just that is a disparity. I'm talking about something different here. I'm talking about inequity, where you have a disparity because of an of an inequitous or inequitable system itself. All right, just to make that I know I didn't put that up there in the takeaways or in the um the uh the the initial slide where I had the uh the learning objectives, that's the word I'm looking for. But I want you to keep that in mind as well. Um, <clears throat> I wanna say also going back to the racial capitalism that many of these conditions are also about the spatial articulation of capital as well. So residential segregation is how capital itself is spatially organized as our factories, as our, you know, so many things in our modern life. All right, here is, uh, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this is, it's one of my favorite schematics for this. This is roughly 20 years old, but it still holds, I think. We could complicate it a bit or rearrange a few things, but this essentially still holds. If we were to think about health effects of segregation, we could think of fundamental causes. These are the kind of macro social ones, right? Such as economic structures, political orders, legal codes, social and cultural institutions, et cetera. Um, residential segregation is a product of that, of course. You have intermediate um, factors, such as physical environment. This is where the environmental justice movement has been so powerful in connecting health outcomes to these macro social issues, right? Um, in the fundamental causes. Um, community infrastructure and social environment. Then there's the proximate, the ones that affect us most directly. Violent crime, ineffective police response, or criminally violent police as well, we could probably put in there as well, right? Um, environmental stressors, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these in the fourth instant produce health outcomes, all right? I'm gonna speak a bit about more about the fundamental intermediate part in this, in this historical reflection. All right, so let's get to the history. For our modern case here in the United States, this is based in, uh, residential segregation is based in the Great Migration. And uh, particularly after the end of slavery in 1865 and the end of Reconstruction in 1877 or 1878, um, I'm sorry, 77 rather, uh, we had 
thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of black people who leave the countryside and they go to cities. At first, these are cities in the South. Um, they're the closest places. But then after um, 1915, during World War I, where there's a greater demand for labor, many people embark on what we now call the Great Migration from South to North. Here we see, I'm not going to go through all of this either, but just to show you kind of in a graphic or in a tabular sense, expansion of black and white populations between 1850 and 1890. And these are five southern cities, all right? And then, as I said, this graph, which is much more simple, looks at uh, movement outside of the South to the North. And you see this decade between 1910 and 1920 is where you see the real jump, and it continues into the 1930s, uh, even as unemployment comes back around in 1920 and 1930. All right. Um, in this mix, was competition, right? People who arrive in a city, when you have thousands of people arriving to a city and in a city where there's, you know, basically no urban planning. Urban planning is really kind of a function of like the post-World War II period. Um, so it's just open free market everywhere. You know, you find housing where you can. Um, in fact, a lot of our residential segregation as a law comes as a result of this. It's not something that happened after slavery. It was actually some decades later where you start to see these laws getting passed in response to Black people finding freedom in cities. Um, and they are in competition with white Americans as well for jobs, for housing, for city services, you know, sanitation services, educational services, all of that. This is, in, is enforced by the law, but also by extra legal terrorist groups um, white supremacist groups, most famously, or shall I say notoriously, the Ku Klux Klan, but a bunch of other ones whose names, you know, we might not recognize right now. Um, we also saw this a bit in the North, but it's principally in the South, I would say. Uh, these factors produce, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, here we go, uh, ill health in a number of ways. This is where I want to go next. I'm sorry, I'm just going to... Um, so yeah, the result, like I said, is poor Black health, um, found in Northern cities, but particularly so in Southern cities. And we should be clear that what we know about mortality and morbidity in the late 19th century and the early 20th century is not very precise. So you're not going to see me really using a whole lot of, you know, two and three decimal points, because we don't really have that kind of precision. But the, the tabular references that we see here are stark enough that even without the decimal, you know, we have just one decimal place here. It's still something that's pretty impressive. You can get the picture, even if it's a broader picture. Um, and you see in uh, mortality death rates here of non-whites and whites, these are kind of broad numbers, but you see very much the discrepancy there the disparity, which is, as I argue, a function of the inequity of it. Um, and here we see the kind of excess mortality between blacks and whites indicated in the shaded area as we go along from 1900. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't mortality. This is um, a life expectancy. So we see, I mean, which is kind of the inverse of, of um, of uh, excess death, right? People live longer, people live less long because of excess mortality, which is based in, you know, other reasons. So we see this between 1900 and, you know, the 1980s or so here. Um, what were the causes of these conditions and this, these disparities and these discrepancies here? As you see here, um, in the main, these were infectious diseases. Right, which is, you know, before the pandemic, you know, this would not have been the case. Most of the discrepancy would have been really from, you know, non infectious conditions, you know, cancers, um, you know, various, you know, asthma, violence, and other, you know, several other conditions as well. Uh, before the 1950s or so, we're really looking at infectious disease. Is tuberculosis and pneumonia, which you could really almost bundle together. They're not the same disease, but you kind of get them the same way. At least a hundred something years ago, you did. Um, it's you know airborne from poor housing, overcrowded housing, et cetera. In fact, many people who had TB were misdiagnosed as pneumonia and vice versa. This is why the two of them are so close together, because in a lot of ways they're almost clinically. I'm not going to say indistinguishable, but if you're not really, if your clinic doesn't have all the diagnostic equipment, it's, it could be the you know, one or the other. Um, 
syphilis also shows up by 1930 um, as well. So these are really, and we could talk about syphilis in the Q&A if, if anyone's curious about that. Um, there's three fundamental causes of black mortality differentials during this period. Um, and I'm going back to the macro here. Voter disenfranchisement um, and lack of adequate political representation. You can't change the conditions around you if you don't really have a political say in it. Um, many people might disagree, might say, well, that's not really a fundamental cause of health or excess mortality or morbidity. Um, I would disagree, right? It all, it really does come down to that. Economic inequities, um, exclusion from certain forms of education, occupations, you know, labor unions, et cetera. And then a poor built environment is another. Um, this would be redlining and, and juridical segregation um in where in these areas where you have like i said lack of sanitary services unclean water unpaved streets etc cetera, etc cetera. um all of these were ways that people got value out of either from people living in pure housing or people who needed occupations and were paid less than were probably what they would have been paid if they were white um and along with the tb and pneumonia along with those that you find taking, you know, particularly a heavy toll in African-American communities are um, diseases of water supply. And these, some of these, I mean, particularly those of you students in the audience who are pre-med or pre-public health professionals or um, have some interest in this will recognize some of these as being in, you know, many places of the world still holding sway over mortality rates. Um, you know, just kind of the, the gastrointestinal diseases, you know, dysentery, um, enteritis, you know, whooping cough, you know, all of these typhoid fever, all of these had a downward pressure on black life expectation, particularly for children under the age of like, you know, five or so. Um, and then for, if you escaped, if you made it to the age of five, you know, within about a decade after that, then you're gonna have to start worrying about tuberculosis and pneumonia, which struck people more or less in their late teens into their forties or so, the prime working years, by the way. Um, which then circles back to the economic inequities. Like this is all cyclic or circular. Um, we did in fact see declines in mortality um, over the decade. Uh, some of that is because of just general improvements in sanitation, but I would say in black communities, not so much. Um, I think there is a way in which in many white communities, the, the decline in mortality is because of, you know, better sewerage, better water, et cetera. But some of those improvements don't extend to black communities in the United States. And so you really see a more um, dramatic decline in the, in the late 60s, you know, from the 50s to the 60s, where it's chemotherapeutic cures, you know, antimicrobials, antibiotics that help to make the difference, which is unfortunate. Um, because, you know, those are, that's a whole population that really, many of them had to wait longer than they might have had to have otherwise. Um, okay, this slide more or less shows the same, and I've already, I'm already ahead of my slides here. So I may pass through this one briefly. All right, so that's, those are the kind of general material um, factors in health disparities um, and health inequities. But I also want to talk a bit about how this material environment, um, the material reality, the lived reality of race. I'm speaking specifically of the United States, but I think my comments here apply or could apply to many other national contexts. In fact, in a lot of ways, the dynamics that I'm about to identify are ones that are imported from other contexts as well, particularly the idea of certain races falling extinct in the wake of exposure to more quote unquote civilized races. This here I'm referring to is the Negro extinction thesis. This idea that black people in freedom, meaning to say they're no longer living under the yoke of slavery and are putatively, ostensibly free to pursue their own you know, fortunes. That's, there's a big asterisk next to that, of course. Um, and the, the theory here is that they in fact will, you know, they can't cut it really. And within a generation or so, some people said within a few years, some people said within a generation, some said uh, maybe a few generations. But anyone who believed that the, the, the Negro race, so to speak, was degenerating um, genetically, at least entertain the idea of extinction. And if you 
if you fervently, if you believe that extinction was was eventual, many people thought it was also imminent that it could happen quite soon. Um, and here I have a quote from uh, a, a physician, Eugene Corson, who said that the African removed from his natural habitat and thrown into a civilization, civilization of which he is not the product, et cetera, et cetera, basically is going to die, will go extinct. All right. This might seem odd to you. Um, this isn't the kind of dialogue or discourse of um, genocide, by the way, after World War II, where um, many racialized populations, particularly in settlers uh, co or um, colonial settler um, societies, such as those that we find here in North America and South America as well, and Australia, and you know that list goes on a bit longer. Um, where those, you know, we can bring an analysis of genocide there that are kind of concerted or even, you know, unconcerted, but still virulent campaign against racialized populations. Um, and largely because of structural racism or state sponsored racism or racial capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what we're talking about here. This is more an ideology of rationalizing and legitimating the factors that I just identified over the past 10 minutes or so. Basically, it's the idea, it's blaming the victim, so to speak, that because they just genetically can't hack it, or maybe they're just not intellectually competent to know how to be hygienic in this modern civilization, and they'll either sink or swim. This will be survival of the fittest, as the social Darwinists would have said. Um, All right. And this was, it's, it's, it's a strange theory. I don't really think outside of, you know, some pretty strange corners of the internet um, that you would find people seriously making an argument like this, but you might be surprised to find out how popular it was. I mean, it wasn't like overwhelmingly popular, but certainly even people who didn't immediately subscribe to the idea, and I mean, white people, um, Certainly, you know, many people say, well, I don't know about extinction per se, but certainly the race is degenerating. That's just obvious, you know, look at, you know, they'll just you know, make up anything, anything. And then we also have to remember that it's very much part of the eugenics movement, which was, you know, I'm trying to use the word virulently too much because I'm just thinking about infectious disease, but certainly uh, massively popular in this hemisphere and in the United Kingdom and, of course, in, in Germany. Um, so it's not, the Negro extinction isn't necessarily itself wildly popular, but it's part of this larger body of thought that actually is. Um, it did not go uncontested, right? And so for my, some of my concluding remarks, I wanna talk about the stage on which, or the stages on which two responses were mounted from black communities. The first is intellectual. Um, we have black physicians, nurses, social scientists, statisticians um, who pick apart the arguments in pretty fine and granular detail to disprove them, to show that they're wrong. Um, that it's actually, when you see poor health in black populations, you're looking at structural issues. You're looking at the, the phrase racial capitalism. I told you it just came from the early 80s. So it doesn't exist. But if you look at what some of these writers are saying, they're basically saying the same thing, that, that you all, meaning white America, has built an entire system around extracting wealth from us. And now one of the wages of that, so to speak, is that we are suffering ill health. All right, I'll talk a bit more about this um, in some detail momentarily. And let me just, again, I've gone ahead of my slides here. Um, All right, so the response, let's just talk about the kind of, let's start with the intellectual. It typically emphasized environmental assaults on black people as a factor in the higher rates of mortality. Um, and quite often used a, a statistical practice that was more accurate and more methodologically sound than those that were brought to bear by the people who predicted black extinction. A kind of classic debate was between W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of this country's leading social scientists in the late 19th um, and, and into the first quarter of the 20th century, and certainly one of its leading political theorists well beyond that as well, into, until his death in 1963. Um, 
But before that, he was trained as a sociologist in Berlin, which was at that time the home of, of or one of the homes of really cutting edge, cutting edge statistical practice. And he takes on this, this other statistician who was not as well trained at all, uh, who was more prone to statistical sophistry and um, obfuscation than it was actual you know, rigorous method. And that, and that was a, a man by the name of Frederick Hoffman. This was a kind of classic or a, a famous debate between the two of them, where Du Bois pointed out everywhere that you've said it indicates that we're going to go into extinction is demonstrably, at the root, it's demonstrably about, you know, poor wages, poor housing, medical neglect down the line. In fact, we can find cities where the white death rate is higher than it is in, of, than the black rate in a different city. And no one ever said, and the classic one they used was, I think it was Munich in Germany, where the death rate was particularly high at the time. And she said, no one ever said that, you know, people in Munich are gonna be racially extinct anytime soon. Everyone knew that it was about the environment. And Du Bois is saying the same thing. He's joined in, in short order by a number of black um, uh, physicians and social scientists, uh, Kelly Miller, um, George Edmund Haynes is someone who's also a, a, an economist and statistician. Sadie Tanner, uh, Sadie Tanner Marcel, um, among others, you know, and they're working from Howard University, um, Atlanta University, Tuskegee Institute, the National Urban League, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you just to focus in or telescope into Du Bois a bit. If you're interested, and I know there are many students in the audience, I'm going to just quickly hit on some of Du Bois's uh, methods. And so you might want to check out his uh, book, The Philadelphia Negro from 1899, which for many decades afterwards, even though it was underappreciated and to this day, even still really, um, but certainly back then was the best work in social science in the United States. His methods, he's not messing around with some of the you know, social scientists here who actually haven't really gotten it together yet. Um, he's taking more methods, methods that are more scientific. Um, and he looks at the African-American presence and its life in Philadelphia, particularly the seventh ward. Um, and like I said, stood as the most rigorous social scientific urban study produced in the United States for quite some time. Um, this is due in, in, in part because of his painstaking analysis of social and environmental conditions. He takes on the matter of tuberculosis and pneumonia, of infant, uh, infant mortality and maternal health, and so many others, and says if you look at areas like this map here shows, um, you will also find areas where you find the highest rates of disease, you will find the lowest rates of sewerage, of access to clean water, of decent housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is followed. Oh, this is uh, just to show you how he's answering the common perception about it, epidemiology. If you see to the left, it's this is a representation by this is a really interesting article by Jones Everly and Dean and from 2018. I'm sorry that I don't have the exact title up here. But the two scholars here show that Du Bois, Du Boisian epidemiology, which is more like what we today call social epidemiology, takes the host as being not just this, um, the infectious germ, the pathogenic germ, but also the social environment and systemic inequality. You can compare that to like the classic John Snow from 1855, who, you know, found the source of cholera by, you know, looking at the water sample and just said, it's just about the water, really. I'm really bastardizing that interpretation there, but you get the point. When you think of these two different ways of thinking about, about health and disease. All right, so we could take Du Bois, but there are many others as, as a kind of emblematic of the intellectual response. Um, but then there's the popular response, black health movements. Um, and I, I, I wanna bring this up because if I had given this lecture, you know, some years ago, like maybe 10 years ago or so, I might've stopped there. But in my investigations, and thinking about it, I realized that really perhaps what might, what might be more important are the popular responses. Keep in mind that Du Bois you know, was not appreciated by the white academic structure at all, really. He left the academy very early in his career. Um, he, had he you know, found a position at, um, you know, at an institution, he might have, you know, I mean, I don't know, but we're not gonna play the counter historical because 
you know, certainly he became a leading civil rights leader and intellectual of a different sort as well. So we can't say what if there. But I also say is that it was more or less an all white enterprise, the American Academy. Um, we might say the same of people like Kelly Miller um, and so many of the physicians and nurses who are working in all black spaces as well. There is difficult for them to actually have an impact on the research. However, there is the political movements, um, such as you know organizations of nurses, of physicians, of regular lay people, such as the National Negro Health Week movement, which began in 1915. On the top um, of the top image here is Booker T. Washington, um, who more or less we could say we can to him we might attribute the idea of a week every year where Black people thought about health and promoted health. And the graph below that shows um, the number of counties or communities that observed National Health Week from 19, more or less 1925 to 1950 or so. Generally speaking, now there's a wide range of political opinion within these movements, um, some more conservative than others, but certainly what they do across the country is highlight the problem of environmental onslaughts. Um, Yes, you do have many people who are saying, you know, the better way to health is if we train Black people to eat more healthily, to clean their houses better, to how to feed their children, et cetera. That's a more socially conservative variant. Um, but at its most critical, you have a, a kind of intellectual and political movement where people, lay people, ordinary people, are able to put some pressure on political superstructures um, where they might not have otherwise had an influence. Keep in mind that, you know, boards of public health in the United States were not hiring Black professionals. It's not until, you know, the second half of the 1920s when you get some of the first ones, really, and even well into the 50s and 60s and later. In fact, it's rare to see Black people in some of these public health spaces or teaching at medical schools, let alone people who are teaching about health inequities, which is really kind of in the last well, Dr. Banerjee was the first one to teach a course at McGill, for example. Um, so this is, you know, these are all recent developments. So 100 years ago, these, these things were definitely not happening. But things happened in the political sphere, where you had people agitating for an address of, of, um, of these conditions. Du Bois also, I, I think the slide is out of order, but another book that I might, to which I might refer you is The Health and Physique of the Negro American from 1906, which is really interesting reading because he also brings together a, a, a bunch of scholars um, to weigh in on the issues of Black health. And it's a really, even, even in 1906, it's this massive landmark study that answers so much of the 19th and early 20th century libels against uh, Black people. Um, these political mobilizations were often gendered as well. And I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time in there because it, um, uh, it's really a, another lecture of its own sort. But I, I do wanna point out that whereas you had certainly separate gendered spheres, um, the number of black women physicians during this period was, was very minute. Um, black women who worked in the health professions were more likely to go into nursing. Um, but that does not mean that it was an entirely subordinate status, certainly in the, in the matter of politics. You certainly had more nurses than you had physicians in any given city. So they were more numerous and can have more impact on Black health and in their own circumstances, working within what, what these are called the women's sphere, were able to put pressure on, on, on nursing schools, on political structures of their own right. Um, and so they interacted with the lay public in ways that black physicians often did not do. And this goes well into the civil rights movement, in fact. And then there were black institutions, hospitals, nursing schools, and medical schools, the earliest of which show up around the 1870s or so. Um, there's a proliferation of them until about 1910, when um, uh, many of them are forced to shut down by licensing and, and uh, accreditation procedures that are put in place. But for a long time, these were some of the only places where Black people could go for health care in an institutional setting, that is. These are all parts of the response to racial capitalism and health inequity um, as well. All right. I don't know why I have the second. I have that. Okay. But all right. For some concluding remarks here, I know this has been a bit of a whirlwind tour, and really, that's really been more suggestive 
than anything else. Um, I started off mentioning COVID, which, you know, when one gives a talk like this, it's almost um, inevitable. It's certainly hard to to escape a comparison. I've been asked to make those comparisons quite often and, and doing so has its can it has its benefits, but I don't want to overdraw it as well. I think certainly COVID-19 has shown us certain things, right? It's shown us how infectious disease and its burdens of death and or mortality, morbidity, often, in fact, you might even say usually, certainly in the case of a coronavirus, fall most heavily on people who are economically and socially marginalized, who, um, you know, who, and particularly those who are on the, you know, on the other end of racial capitalism, the losing end of it, so to speak. Um, there are some limitations to that lesson, so to speak, uh, or maybe not limitations, but I don't want to overdraw it. Um, first of all, I, I ended the last, my last comments with a discussion briefly about institutions. I don't think that's the answer now. I'm not at all, I'm not one of these people who says, you know, what black people should do is build more black institutions. Black institutions have been of great benefit and continue to be, absolutely. But um, there's a difference between supporting those, which I do, and being retreatist and thinking that, well, you know, if the state won't do it, then we'll do it for ourselves. I, I don't really think that way because, well, we pay taxes. You know, we are citizens like everybody else. Um, secondly, hospitals and medical schools and nursing schools are just infrastructural. You just can't support your own like you could have 125 years ago. These are big biomedical institutions um, in which, you know, they, these are public goods, so to speak. Um, similarly, I don't think the takeaway here is that COVID taught us something, so to speak. And in a lot of ways, it reminded us of what many people knew 100 years ago, but we forgot. Some of that amnesia is because in the 1950s, beginning in the 40s, certainly by the 1950s, it seemed like a lot of infectious disease was on its way into the, you know, quote unquote, dustbin of, of history. If anyone was talking about extinction in the 1950s, they might have been, you know, hoping for the extinction of polio or, um, you know, tuberculosis or something, you know, clearly did not happen. But certainly that was the kind of modern um, modernist optimism that held sway at the time. So we forgot about what infectious disease taught us about health inequity. COVID-19, HIV reminded us again, I mean, for a long time, we didn't know that lesson, but certainly by the 1990s, we connected HIV to structural inequalities um, here in, the, in North America and also around the world. Um, I think COVID-19 has reminded us of something that we should have had in mind in 2018 and 2019, but which we didn't. And I think that's how we were caught off guard. And, you know, I remember very clearly April and May of 2020 when the data came out and said that black people and, and Latino people, you know, Latinx people were dying at much higher rates. And as a historian, I remember thinking, yeah, that, that kind of, I'm not very surprised by that, but a lot of people were. And I think it's because we had forgotten some of these lessons. Um, I would have liked to have ended on a more optimistic note, but I think there is some optimism here. As long as we keep our eyes on the mobilization part, which we have seen in the context of COVID, particularly that summer and since of 2020, where Black Lives Matter meant not just police brutality, but also our lives in the context of medical care, in the context of education and of housing um, and so many other things as well. There are reasons for optimism. I, I actually, I am optimistic, particularly as long as we are keeping our eye on the structural ball uh, moving forward. So with that, I look forward to further engagement with, uh, with you, the audience, and thank you again to my hosts uh, for making all this possible. Thank you. I'm still not used to like not hearing an applause on this. So I'm sorry that I just realized I, I want to look and say, are you all still there? Is anyone still around? Yeah, so uh, everyone... <laughs> like, silence yeah. applauding. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm, I'm, I wasn't fishing for applause, but uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah. So in any case, um, I don't know. How do we do the Q&A, Aman and Ananya? How, how do you all prefer to do this? <laughs>
Um, so we have many questions coming uh, through the chat, uh, which I would love to oh, yes. um, begin with. And I do have a couple of questions on my own, but I will leave them um, to the uh, near end. Um, so we have a question. Our first one is, can you comment on the link between the transnational eugenics movements and the science of public health and policy that derives from that science? In what ways is this baggage with us today and what students of public health learn? Wow. Coming out, who, whose question was that? Who is that? Do you have a name? It's Dr. Razek. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Salim. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Um, in a longer version of this talk, which I know is kind of crazy to say, because I did go for about a solid 40 minutes, right, or almost, um, I would have fleshed that out a bit. So it is, it's, I'll say, I'll try to reduce this to maybe a two-pronged answer. On one hand, like I said, the idea of eugenics is, it's in the air. A lot of people, I think historically, we kind of remember some of the most virulent eugenicists, the ones who made careers from eugenics research. Um, but then there's the popular movement, which is much larger, right? Um, certainly, it's that movement that informs ideas of racial degeneration, or it's mutually informative. Um, and the idea of Negro extinction is obviously part and parcel of that. What I find interesting about public health history, though, is that in its ideal, when I say ideal form, I don't mean like hopefully, I mean, like as a kind of like in a platonically ideal sense, what public health is supposed to do, what it was, what it was, you know, articulated as in the late 19th and early 20th century is the use of science and the manipulation of, of environment to promote the health of a given population. There's a certain kind of um, modernist and scientific optimism in that, that you don't really often see in eugenics, certainly not negative eugenics. Negative eugenics is the idea of like, you need to prevent racially inferior others from breeding. Positive eugenics is you need to encourage the more, you know, fit of the species, so to speak, to propagate more. And a negative eugenics is decidedly pessimistic. Um, and you did have people who said, you know what, public health for Black people, that's just a waste of time. They're going to be extinct anyway, and it probably won't help them. Um, you didn't really see that in public health, though. What you saw in public health was a kind of qualified inclusion based on an idea of racial utilitarianism. So you'd have public health people, white public health people, I'm saying, because before, you know, like I said, 1930s or so, you really didn't have many black people in public health. Um, some black public health nurses, but yeah, not, yeah, any case, um, you would have people saying, you know, maybe uh, the jury might be out. Are they racially inferior? I, who am I to say? I'm not a genetist. I'm a public health person. Um, what I do know is that they live and work amongst us. And if we neglect their health at the peril of our own, so this, this is what I've called elsewhere racial utilitarianism, where it's not about including people because they're just, you know, they're human beings, for God's sake, um, and they deserve what everyone else deserves. It was more kind of a, uh, enlightened self-interest, so to speak. So that type of pessimism isn't really there in public health. You do see it in medicine. And to the second part of your question about the legacy of that, that goes on today, in fact. Um, you know, we have instances, I mean, we could say certainly a, a, what you might call latter day eugenics or a neo eugenic thinking in a lot of our um, social welfare policies, right? Where we, you know, do not support, you know, children of the poor. The idea of that being, you know, it's like, well, those are your children, you support them on your own. Well into the 1970s, and we see this even today, it's not legal, but it was legal well into the 1970s, really of um, what they used to call the Mississippi appendectomy. You know, women who would go to a hospital with any kind of complaint, you know, um, they say appendectomy because it might've been just, you know, appendicitis or whatever. And then while they're under the knife, the doctor would um, do a tubal ligation so they can't have children and wouldn't tell them. Um, and this happened in Los Angeles, happened, you know, throughout the South, North Carolina. Um, the mid Indiana was a big place for all this stuff too. Um, so certainly that legacy is there in medicine, I would say. Um, yeah. So that's the kind of short answer to a longer complicated question. Thank you for that. Ananya, uh, who else is in the queue? Yes, we have a lot of questions. Um, so oh. the next question is, uh, so many, uh, 
folks in this audience um, watched uh, Miss Evers' uh, Boys. And so we have a question who uh, a question from someone who watched it saying, in the movie, we saw that a Black doctor and nurse were part of the lie. How do we reconcile that? And what may have led them to continue? They seem to imply that at least participants were getting some level of health care, when usually at that time they would have gotten none. Is this really it? or were they coerced or brainwashed? Great question. Um, and that was a question that people were asking for, in, you know, for many years after the revelation in the early 70s about the, t the study. Um, I will say this, I don't, uh, I don't do psychohistory, so to speak, which, I, you know, I'm not even sure that's actually a, a thing that's anyone in which anyone is trained. But I did not interview anybody who was involved in the studies. So I don't know to what degree they were brainwashed or being careerist or whatever. Um, certainly, probably allegations of careerism might not be entirely unfounded. Um, I think some of them might have believed that they were doing something right in the sense that, you know, if one convinces oneself that, you know, these are people who had syphilis anyway, and they would, their chances are they would have gotten no treatment. So us not treating them and studying it at least will help somebody in the future. That's certainly not the, eth the ethical standards by which I conduct my life, or nor would I if I were a medical professional. But I think there are a number of people then and today who do that. Um, I could recommend, um, I just, a couple of nights ago, I interviewed Harriet Washington for uh, our local, not our local, for the National Public Broadcasting Service down here. Um, she has a new book about informed consent, which I highly recommend. And of course, her book, um, Medical Apartheid, where she talks about medical abuses like Tuskegee. Um, but a lot of that was, you know, within the realm of medical ethics. I mean, we have to remember that these were people who were publishing their results like about every five years or so. This wasn't like a secret test or, you know, study that was done in a bunker somewhere out in the desert. Like this was kind of out in the open. Um, I don't know what was going through their heads to be, to be precise. Um, I, I think part B to that two, one B to a two part answer is that ethics are also historical. So things, and I'm not exculpating anyone. I think, I honestly think that in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, I mean, it began in, in the 30s, people doing the study should have said something. Um, I don't think the ethical systems in which they were working were that much different from the ones in which we work, you know, decades later. But um, certainly our bioethical guidelines are different today. You could not do that study today, ethically or legally, but it was perfectly allowable until the 1970s. The second part, my, uh, my second answer to that is, is, that's an excellent question, but it's questions, I kind of shy back, shy away from questions like that because I'm more interested in structures. Not because I don't think people have responsibility, in, you know, individual responsibility. I think they do. But we also need to think of the structures in which they operate. And by structures, I mean, what are people, what incentives do, does a system give them to behave the way they do? Um, and I think in, I started off with racial capitalism for that reason, because that's a system. It's a system that gives a lot of people a lot of incentives to do a lot of things that in 2022, we say people, people are doing things right now that we right now would say that is really unethical. But within those systems, those, you know, they, they take advantage of the incentives, um, particularly, again, going to, to Harriet Washington's book. She shows that very clearly where right now black people are being experimented on. It's perfectly legal. It's perfectly abides by the American Medical Association's codes of ethics and all that. But if, you know, read the book, please do. It's called um, Carte Blanche, The Erosion of Medical Consent or er Erosion of, it's either Informed Consent or Medical, Carte Blanche is the title. Um, read it it's, uh, um, and you'll see that, that there's people who are acting on incentives. They are paid in patents or in prestige or any number of things to do these things. Um, and it happens so often and so frequently and perpetrated by so many people that at a certain point you start to say, yeah, individual responsibility certainly needs to be ascribed here and needs to be considered. But 
at what point is it just individual outliers, you know, bad apples in the basket, so to speak? Or are we just, is this a system that's, you know, not making people do it, but certainly not making them not do it and certainly encouraging them to do it. So, yeah, I kind of, I feel like I danced around the answer. And who, whose question was that again? Who, who asked that question? Do you remember, Ananya? Um, it was someone who actually asked it privately. So perhaps they don't want to. Okay. Well, in that case, I, to whoever it is, I apologize for not giving a, a completely or a complete answer, but um, that is my answer though. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have time for one or two more? I don't know what, uh, what time do you have to release the audience? Um, one thirty. So, okay. Oh, so we've got some time. Great. Fantastic. Yes. Um, our next question is uh, from Carlos. Um, he is one, uh, they are wondering what could a balance be? Be between accreditation, qualification exams, entrance exams, and other systems and structures that are put in place in the name of safety, but have been used to historically leave certain groups out. Could there be a better way to balance this? Accreditation, well, I heard accreditation, but I think there were two other nouns that uh, I might have missed. Accreditation, qualification exams, entrance exams, and other systems and structures. I, I'm thinking they're thinking about medical education in this context. And leaving people out of, I guess, out of, out of healthcare, like people, patients who aren't getting appropriate care or. I don't know. So actually oh. I was going to ask if Carlos is comfortable, um, would you mind asking? Yes, please unmute yourself. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I was thinking broadly speaking, because um, uh, this conversation got me thinking about all the moving pieces of healthcare. So it's, um, thinking about the the workforce who like the actual practitioners um, I'm in communication sciences and disorders and um, one thing is for sure that the number of um, SLPs and researchers in communication sciences and disorders who are people of color overall is just very very low let alone um, black researchers and SLPs so I'm, I'm thinking overall these systems are put in place to for safety reasons but even from the get-go, um, as you mentioned um, earlier in this presentation, uh, there were movements to, to create your own, like own uh, black owned spaces uh, and due to all these barriers. And we're still kind of dealing with that. So I'm wondering if, could there be a better way to balance everything? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Carlos. And it's, it's a, uh... It's a question which is greater than my capacity to answer, to be <clears throat> very frank. Um, I'm not a specialist in medical education. I do get asked that question a lot. So, um, but on each occasion, I usually beg off because I am not a specialist in that at all. I get invited to speak at a lot of medical schools and almost invariably that question will come up. Um, and I tried not to, but I do, I have some thoughts, which is to say that what I think I'm seeing, and I don't know how it is there in Montreal, here, um, we're starting to see medical schools that take into account more than just, you know, the scientific competency, which is absolutely, I think you've made a reference to safety. I would say, yeah, I mean, we don't want, you know, we certainly want to make sure that people are doing things in a safe manner, but also we also want to know that there's some sort of structural competency as well um because to be honest um you know a lot of horrid things have been done by people who were eminent scientists um the eugenics movement is not science today but it, believe believe me it was generally regarded as good science in the 19 teens and 20s uh, even the 30s um so yeah the scientific part of it is not enough. Um, and I think if, as long as, if we fetishize, you know, oh, this person had, you know, they completely aced their qualifying exams in, you know, molecular biology or something and all that. And it's like, well, how's their humanity? You know, how, how you know, have we tested their ethics? Um, have we seen them in a clinical setting, um, working with people that don't come from backgrounds from which they have emerged? How's that look, you know? Um, if, if we're not asking that question, then yeah, we could easily replicate some of the atrocities that have happened, you know, throughout history and all across, you know, certainly in our two countries. So, yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. Um, we have Samir, um, who would like to, uh, ask you a question live. 
Hey, Samir. Hey, <laughs> thanks so much. First, I just wanted to say that it's so great, um, you know, that SACE uh, and others are organizing a session like this. It's not every day that uh, I think the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science at McGill has to serious, seriously engage with Black radical traditions. <laughs> and so I think that's an important, um, that's important in and of itself. Um, I'm kind of, I guess, coming from, uh, so I'm a pediatric emergency physician at, uh, here in Montreal. Um, and I guess my own, uh, my own um, trajectory has been influenced heavily by, you know, folks like Asada Shakur and Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Robin Kelly, um, as well as Cedric Robinson. But what I've, uh, I actually, um, uh, uh, when, when, when reading um, uh, Black Marxism, I started researching more about him and I came across his book, The Terms of Order, Political Science and the Myth of Leadership. Um, I think it was one of his prior books. And what was really interesting to me is how, uh, how in that book, he basically flips totally on its head the very ways in which uh, those of us in the West are meant to know like what we know and how we know and how we learn. Um, mm. And I see this kind of playing out in medicine in so many ways. You, you know, you touched on in your slide about the, you know, medicalized social Darwinism and those narratives that continue. Um, and I feel like it continues in so many ways, including even the example of COVID that you've, you've brought up, right? I, I'd have had colleagues early on in the pandemic that when we were seeing, um, you know, folks from black communities who were impacted more by COVID the knee-jerk response was, oh, but you know, what's the biological or genetic, uh, you know, issue when <laughs> people just don't think about? Um, we're not taught, unfortunately, most of us in medicine and other health sciences to think about these things in in very different ways. So I guess my question, um, and you know, coming to you as 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 a, as a historian, um, uh, it ties into uh, to what extent, one, I think you've already answered, do those medicalized social Darwinist narratives still exist? But um, I guess more interestingly would be, are you aware of uh, examples of kind of just new ways um, of knowing in healthcare um, uh, that, you know, uh, and also, but also in public health, uh, public and, and health policies that can kind of um, move us away from kind of the indoctrination, the way we are often taught. And I feel like, you know, Alondra Nelson and Harriet Washington have done really important work on exposing medical violence, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Black communities. But I am I feel like that I'm not, I haven't come across very much yet um, entirely uh, new ways of, of knowing how to know, basically knowing how to learn um, from uh, either a historical perspective, but also a contemporary perspective in medicine or in healthcare. So curious for your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, thank you, Samir. <clears throat> um, in many ways, what certainly what I was alluding to in my comments and slides, um, in many ways, these are uh, issues that are epistemic, right? As you said, ways of knowing. That's certainly true. Um, it's more than just perspective or you know turning something around a little bit i mean these are in a lot of ways these are truly epistemic questions and you know one's epistemic stance at least i believe you know perhaps in a i don't think an overly materialist sense often comes from one subject position um that said the quote unquote like different ways of knowing i'm not so sure about I think certainly revising curriculum, as we've seen happen again, I, this is where I'm, I, if I seem tentative in my response, because like I said, I don't do medical curriculum. Um, that's not, you know, I, I work in a, I have an appointment in a public health school, not in medical school. So I actually, those are, you know, two very, very different institutions there. But um, certainly I think the ways that doctors are being trained today are certainly different from how they were 30 years ago, um, which is more or less when some of the health disparities work came back again. That back then they called it health disparities. Um, yeah, like the late 80s, early 90s, I think is when all this started to really reemerge. Because like I said, a lot of this was in the air in the early 20th century as well. So, um, <clears throat> 
but if you're talking about specific, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around because you said ways of knowing a few times. I'm not quite sure I know what you mean by that. Besides, I mean, are you talking about like different methods or like what, what do you mean precisely? Yeah, I mean, I guess it ties in a bit also to, um, and, and this goes in public health, but also in medicine in general. Um, but uh, so I think, for example, you, you, I think, alluded to earlier just how, um, you know, how, uh, how different forms of knowledge can also be, have also historically been erased, right? Um, including different forms of healing um, and medical knowledge. So I guess I'm, I did a study around uh, trying to look at medical violence inflicted on Indigenous children in Canada. And that's one thing that I didn't necessarily go into, but I did come across a lot of um, was, was uh, the amount of health related knowledge that has been destroyed through processes of, you know, colonialism and slavery and capitalism, essentially, from communities that have been oppressed or exploited. Um, and so I guess when I'm talking about uh, ways of knowing, drawing on Cedric Robinson's earlier work, it's those other ways of knowing. Um, and it's not to like romanticize or, you know, uh, homogenize previous different forms of knowing, but it's basically um, recognizing that uh, a lot of uh, different forms of knowing um, may actually help us to be better at healing in our in our in our work, and the only uh, work that I've come across recently has been by uh, Rupa Maria and Raj Patel in uh, in in the book they wrote called Inflamed, uh, Deep Medicine and the Medis and the Anatomy of Injustice, where they kind of try to do this a bit of like looking at different communities. Um, forms of knowledge um, and how that can be used in, in, in healthcare uh, in a way that counters the Western kind of colonial paradigm. But I guess I'm just curious in your work as a historian, if you've come across other, um, you know, uh, works like that, um, that could be uh, used or implemented in, in, in curricula, I guess, even though I know you don't do curricula, but just in your work, I'd be interested. I mean, it sounds like you've answered your own question there in terms of finding new ways of knowing things. I mean, it sounds like you've I mean, as you've just outlined it for us, that you've expanded your own training, perhaps, you know, autodidactically, but nonetheless, that you've in, embarked on that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I, I would, I would, in answer, I would just offer more of encouragement. Yeah, I mean, and hopefully one day you'll be teaching. I, I don't know, do you teach in a, in a medical school now? You said you're a practitioner. Are you teaching or you're a faculty member? Yeah, I'm a faculty member as well. All right. Well, I think, yeah, it sounds like you've answered your question then. Yeah. And I'm glad to glad to meet you and glad to know that you are doing that work. Are those works on your syllabus and those experiences that you've just described? Have you imparted those to your, student, your That's students? Right. I'm not, I think I, I try to make points around around the importance of, of you know, different, different um, recognizing different forms of knowledge, epistemologies. Um, but I don't think we're, we're there yet. That's why I guess I was curious just if you have other suggestions. I feel like I, it, we need to broaden beyond the, beyond the handful, I guess, that, that often you know, get, get used. Mm, so I much. see, yeah. Well, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, that's probably a question I could answer offline. I mean, I could like share a syllabus with you, certainly. Yeah. Thanks, Samir. Um, a question that we have um, from Tim Evans is from a slightly more recent historical perspective. Do you have any perspectives on David Satcher's leadership on health equity? Um, Tim, if you're here, uh, feel free to come on screen. I don't. I haven't been paying attention to Dr. Satcher's uh, comings and goings. Then I'm, I'm more, I do pay it to, you know, I'm a member of the American Public Health Association and like I said, I interact with public health practitioners, et cetera, et cetera. But my most comfortable lane is the historical one. So, yeah, I don't. I mean, are you talking about his contemporary leadership or his historical leadership? I mean, the answer is no to both, because, I mean, the lane I've, in which I've been working most recently is in addiction politics and re the politics of rehabilitation, um, an area in which, as I've as far as I know, David Satcher is not particularly active. So I'm afraid I don't have any reflections on that. Great, sorry, um, Ananya, my, my screen is, uh, is not lighting up because of another problem, technical problem, but, but thanks Samuel. And, and the intention of the program was, of the question was really David Satcher uh, when he was Surgeon General uh, put health equity very deliberately front and center on the agenda. And I think that was perhaps the first time to my knowledge 
uh, that health equity had ever been put forward uh, by any uh, leader uh, in in the United States as a priority. And uh, you know, today you have health equity leaders and officers in virtually every HMO and uh, every state administration. So, um, and then the second thing is he has created the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. Uh, which uh, I think is focused on cultivating leadership on this. So it was just really in that, in that light. But I, I appreciate that this may be much too modern and recent for, for serious historical assessment. So no, it was just uh, no, it's not that. I thought you were might have, uh, looked at it. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were mean. I thought you were saying something more contemporary, like what he's doing today. No, I, I, I'm aware of his career in the. Um, in the 90s and early aughts yes absolutely it was his was not the first time the federal government got in this there's the um oh my god i'm forgetting the name of the report but the head of hh hew which is today called hh i'm sorry i'm you all are in canada the health and human services Depart department of health and human services used to be called the department of health education and welfare and the head of that i'm forgetting her name but under her her leadership, HEW published a pretty substantial report on um, on health disparities, like black and to a lesser extent Latino communities here. Um, now, what Satcher did might have been the first time that a Surgeon General got involved in that, but our Department of HEW had in the '80s as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question, and again, if um, you would, if you can't answer this question, please do so. Then we can just keep moving on uh, from other to other questions. Um, Mary Lynn asks, "Where do you see the skyrocketing real estate market going and its relation to health inequities?" Hmm. By the way, um, Tim, the name of the report was the Heckler Report. Yeah, that's yeah, Heckler, like. Well, someone who heckles somebody, I guess. Um, real estate. I take it. I take it. That question is a reference to gentrification, perhaps, and and just. I mean, just kind of like these more or less um, recurrent uh, real estate booms. Um, I certainly think there's going to be a detrimental impact. I think that uh, certainly place is. If you perhaps more than anything, place is something that's important in terms of health promotion and health maintenance. And when one's environment is insecure for whatever reason, um, that's almost inevitably going to have a downward pressure on the quality of life and health. More specifically than that, I'm not sure what you, what you might mean. Um, if you're if you're saying that with rising prices in real estate, how people are being pushed out of out of affordable housing, uh, then I think that the jury's in on that. Um, I mean, if there's one thing that we know, I mean, <laughs> housing insecurity is not good for your health. That's just that's indisputable. Um, if you're asking for something more granular, more specific, that is, hmm. Yeah, I gotta say, I don't follow enough of real estate to know specifically. I do know a few markets. I mean, I live here in New York, and so that's been an issue for decades, affordable housing. Um, and it, it, the issues there kind of redound into all different types of directions. You know, people who, you know, end up having to leave home earlier than they might otherwise have. And then, then they strike out on their own, but they don't have, you know, the the safety net or the the resources to do it the way somebody else might have if they had more secure housing in their family. Um, certainly a number of people who just can't afford to rent at all and they live in places that are just, you know, unsafe and unhygienic. Um, then there's there's other po directly um, or policies that more directly have an impact. So here in this country, for example, um, certain types of felony records and you're ineligible for public housing. And if you live with somebody, if you stay with somebody in public housing and that person's discovered, they will be evicted as well. I'm talking particularly about um, like drug law offenses in particular. Um, 
people with criminal, um, you know, who have a, a record of some sort um, are at a disadvantage for the rest of their lives for the most part, you know, in terms of hiring, housing, education, as long as someone's able to ask you, do you have a record? And a lot of these applications do ask you that. They will always be at a disadvantage. Um, in markets where real, the price of real estate goes up, rents go up, even, it's just even more so. So, uh, yeah, but if there's something more specific to the question, I'm, not, I'm probably not getting it. And I'm sorry about that. I also find that in Zoom, I'm so not used to like, I, it's so much easier when you enter, you're, when you're in a room and you're making eye contact with somebody and you can kind of read body language when you, when someone asks a question. So I'm, I'm still not adept at doing the whole Zoom even two years later. So Zoom q and I apologize for that. It's okay. It's completely fine. Um, we are going to wrap up. Um, and so I'd love um, my colleague, Dr. Razak and Iman um, to please come on. So, um, I just wanted to say um, on behalf of the School of Population and Global Health, um, Dr. Um, uh, Roberts, uh, for this continued engagement with history that is so vital uh, to help us give us context for the present, particularly for us as, as faculty members, you know, who are teaching um, public health and medical curriculum, um, often history is entirely dismissed and there has been a lot of resistance, particularly um, in terms of talking about eugenics, talking about the Tuskegee study, um, bringing these as like very solid conversations uh, into the classroom. Um, so thank you for, for, for this. Um, February is Black History Month in the US and Canada, and it is a chance to celebrate Black achievement and provide a fresh reminder to reevaluate where systemic racism persists and gives visibility to the people and organizations creating change that is lifelong. I do appreciate your optimism that we are- It's my pleasure, shifting. my pleasure. I might, I might also say, I think I see in the audience, Dr. Shaw, Melissa Shaw, um, who uh, might be able to answer some of these questions that I was not entirely able to do. So I just put you in the hot seat, Melissa, and I apologize for that, which <laughs> it's good to see you though. Be here. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was really amazing. Um, and just Thank the you the structures and analytically rigorous so i really appreciate that thank you so much thank you for those kind words and thank you for attending good to see you. and hopefully we'll see each other at, at our conferences if they ever let us back in the same convention hall again so so with that um i i will bring uh the session to a close i, I just i just have one minute of uh, observations you know um over many years um uh, medical students from racialized backgrounds come to me have come to me around a sense of feeling um, inauthentic around the constructs of professionalism that we are, are taught. And, and this is indeed um, some of my experience as well. And I think some of it has to do with not hearing uh, uh, the histories uh, of voice, voices coming from the past that we need to hear uh, to help us mm. situate ourselves within um, histories of meaning. Uh, and I, I, I wanna say that for today, your conversation about racial capitalism, uh, you know, your situation of the rash, that rationalization um, of, of it through uh, the Negro extinction uh, thesis, um, uh, for me, uh, helped me understand that, you know, like in addition to Sir William Osler, we come from this as well, and we need to understand and own this, and that that helps me as a racialized person have better, uh, a, a more authentic sense of of um, professionalism uh, for myself. And um, I, I just want to say thank you so much for the uh, elevated discussion, and um, to uh, Dr. Evans and to Ananya, thank you so much for uh, this partnership that allowed uh, allowed us to. Uh, bring Dr. Kelton Roberts here. And I, I hope that we will continue doing st stuff like this in the future. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And I um, hope I can come back and maybe in person. I love Montreal. So it'd be good to, to see everyone in person. In the meantime, everyone be safe and, and uh, have a good weekend. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks to our audience.
Bye, Nani.